Welcome to Pathway Church Online. We're so glad that you're here today with us, sharing the morning with us. And we hope that you engage, that you worship with us. We invite you to do that today. We don't want you to miss out on this opportunity, this experience, and miss experiencing God. So come on, let's worship. Let's have church together. You are here. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, come on, let's invite him, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you. Make a 
miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker. sing Waymaker one more time. Come on. Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 You are my breakthrough. Your 
you're making all things new. You're making all things new. It's what you always do. You are my breakthrough. You're making all things new. You're making all things new. It's what you always do. You are my breakthrough. Take me from where I've been into something new. I'm giving up control. I need a breakthrough. All of my dreams and fears are crashing into you. You're waking up my hope. You are my breakthrough. You are my breakthrough. We're so glad that you're with us today for part one of our brand new series. I want to start with a question, and I want you to think about this for just a minute. What story do you remember most from your childhood? What childhood story made an impact in your life, in your little life as a child, more than any other story? My story is Danny and the Dinosaur. Man, I remember when I first read this book, it was in Mrs. McCaslin's kindergarten class, and I was at the purple table. I remember reading this book, and I actually, don't tell anybody, I actually uh, borrowed this from the school library, shh, and I didn't bring it back for four weeks because I loved this book. Finally, my mom found out, and we had to take it back. Um, but I loved this book. And now, you know, I've moved, obviously, past Danny and the Dinosaur. I was captivated with it then, but I've moved past that. But I'm, I'm still always hooked by a good story. Uh, anytime I watch a movie or read a book, I'm, I'm hooked by a good plot, a good story. Today we're beginning this brand new series called Once Upon a Time. And we're going to walk through the stories that Jesus told in the book of Luke, specifically in the book of Luke. But first, I I wanted to share a passage with you that the Apostle Matthew shares with us and tells us, talking about how Jesus used stories. It says, Jesus always used stories when speaking to the crowds. He never spoke to them without using parables. That's an interesting word, parables. One of the, the storytelling tools that Jesus used most was parables. The parables of Jesus are found in the Synoptic Gospels um, that are actually Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, They form approximately one-third of Jesus' teaching. And most of Jesus' parables are actually found in the book of Luke. That's why we're going to look at that most. There are many thoughts about the parables that Jesus told, but I think uh, the best definition is a parable is a short story Jesus told using everyday life to help people understand and respond to a spiritual truth. Now, there's three characteristics about Jesus' parables that are, that are noteworthy. The first one is that Jesus' parables are all brief, short stories. I mean, you can read them really quickly. The second is that Jesus' parables usually make one simple point. Generally, Jesus is focused on a single point. That's what he's trying to get across to his listeners. Also, Jesus used parables to get people's attention. There, were, there was shock value to him. It was to make people think, make people respond. And we're going to see that as we study the parables in our series in the book of Luke. But as we get started today, let's start off with prayer. Jesus, we ask that you would teach us today, just like you taught the crowds years ago, that you would teach us today through one of your parables. We ask that our hearts would be open, our minds would be open to your word and that you would speak directly into our lives, and that we would see not only the story that you tell, and it's not so much important about the the details of the story, it's it's what you're trying to say to us, that we would hear your voice today. 
Thank you for allowing us to hear your words. Be with us. Speak to us today. We pray it in your name. Amen. So Jesus is constantly receiving criticism for doing things differently. We see an example of this in Luke chapter 5, verse 33. It says, one day some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? I mean, they're saying, why do you do things differently, Jesus? Why are you always rocking the boat? Why are you threatening status quo? Why are you going against tradition? Why don't you and your disciples just do like everybody else is doing? The implication is that Jesus and his followers aren't as spiritual as John the Baptist and the Pharisees and the religious leaders because they don't fast. Scripture only requires the Jews to fast one one time, one day, a year. But the Jewish religious leaders now, they wanted to add on more and more rules. So they added on the number of days that they needed to fast. And if you didn't fast, you were viewed as not very spiritual. The Pharisees would fast twice a week, every week. And man, they would make sure that everyone knew they were fasting. They would wear certain clothes. They would make their their face white. They would make quite a show of it. The disciples of John, um, they they were fasting about once a week. But Jesus and his disciples, (laughs) they, they were known for eating and drinking and laughing and having a good time. They were the party crowd. This was totally different from how the religious did things. And Jesus tells them, you know, I'm sorry. uh, You got this all wrong. I mean, he says, I'm here to change things, to make things new. And look what he explains in verse 36, telling an illustration or a parable. Jesus gave them this illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. Now, when we read this, we, you know, get fixed on this idea of the old garment. And we may think of, at least I thought of, an old pair of jeans. An old pair of jeans that, you know, maybe had some holes in them. I've got an old pair of jeans like this. Maybe you do too in your closet or in your, you know, your, your drawers. You've got an old pair of jeans like this that, that has some holes in it. And, and I've got some. And, and we know that, you know, you, to fix it, you just, you know, you get a scrap of cloth and you, you cover it. We know that if you, you sew a, a new piece of cloth onto an old garment... The, the patch will tear away, and, and it'll shrink in the wash, and the old garment doesn't shrink. And we know how that works. And so if you're patching old clothes today, in modern day, well, you get a pre-shrunk patch. In fact, you don't even sew it on. You just iron it on, right? But that's not the, the, the case in Jesus' culture, in Jesus' time. In fact, that's not what Jesus is teaching in this parable. See, Jesus is actually being very funny And sometimes we miss this because we miss the humor in the the culture. But I bet everybody laughed. Everybody was chuckling at what Jesus was sharing that day. Because, see, Jesus isn't focused on the, the old clothes. I want you to read it again with me, verse 36. It says, no one tears a piece of cloth from a what? A new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. Let me ask you a question. What is the subject? It's the new garment. Jesus says no one cuts a piece from new clothes to repair old clothes. So it's really like me wanting to patch my old pair of blue jeans, this hole in my old pair of blue jeans. And so what I would do is I'd go out and I'd buy a brand new pair of blue jeans. And what I would do then, Jesus says, is I would cut a piece out of the new blue jeans to patch the hole in my old blue jeans. Now you can laugh with him, right? Now you get the idea of what he's trying to communicate. I mean, he's saying, you wouldn't do that. He's saying, what sense would that make? If I patch my old blue jeans with a cut-out piece from my new blue jeans, you know what happens? I'm ruining both pair of blue jeans. Just wear the new blue jeans. I mean, that's what Jesus would say. Just wear the new blue jeans. Don't patch the old with the new. Throw out the old and wear the new. What Jesus was communicating to religious leaders in that day was, and the people too, was that the way you're following God was okay when it was new. But now, your way of following God is old, 
and it's full of holes. And Jesus said, I'm not here to patch up your old way of following God. No, I'm here to give you a new way of following God. In fact, in our language, I'm here to give you a new pair of blue jeans. Don't cut up these new pair of blue jeans to fix the old ones. Don't, don't add the new onto the old. No. You need to throw out the old and keep the new. You need to throw out the old and wear the new. Jesus is bringing something new. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to conform to their old ways. But, but you can't take new ways and then plop them onto old traditional religion. Jesus says it doesn't work. Old ways and new ways don't mix. You, you can't have patchwork religion. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't have patchwork religion and expect to be right with God. You can't just add Jesus into how you're already living your life. Wow, that's a big statement. That's, that's not following Jesus. You can't just add him into your life. Jesus only does new things in our lives. Jesus is bringing something new to our lives. You can't just add in church to your schedule and call yourself a follower of Jesus. You can't just add in prayer to your routine and call yourself a follower of Jesus. You can't add in Jesus into your old life and think that you're following him. That's not following Jesus. Are you doing that? If so, Jesus is speaking right to you today. And he's saying you can't keep living the old way and think you're becoming new. It doesn't work that way. In fact, verse 37, Jesus makes the same point. He gives a little bit different parable here. He says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. So the image of a wineskin is a little bit foreign to us, and I understand that. We, we think of wine being kept in barrels. So, you know, our modern minds don't really wrap around this idea of a wineskin. But wineskins were very popular in Jesus' day. It was the only way to do it. And so everybody knew how to make wine. In fact, if you live in Israel, you live in Palestine, wine was a thing. I mean, there were vineyards everywhere. And nobody in their right mind would put new wine in an old wineskin. Everybody knew that new wine must have a new wineskin. See, what happens is grapes were harvest, harvested and then they were crushed so that juice could be collected. And people would take the grape juice and pour it into wineskins to keep it, to store it, to, to allow it to ferment. Now, wineskins, they, they were made from the cured and tanned skins of goats, goat skin. And, and because of the climate, um, wine would ferment very quickly in Palestine. And so as the grape juice would ferment, what it would do is it would produce gas. The wineskins would bulge almost to bursting as the carbon dioxide gas that was being generated by the fermentation process would begin to stretch this wineskin to its limit. And by this point, the collagen protein that gives the goat skin its flexibility, its stretching, is now gone because of the alcohol content, it destroys its resiliency. And so the skin's ability to stretch anymore or to stretch again has been lost. And once the wine is in poured out and you have an empty wine skin, you can't use it again. It's completely stretched. I mean, if you took unfermented wine, new wine, and you poured it into an old wine skin that had already been stretched out, the gas buildup from fermentation would eventually become so great that this inflexible wine skin would tear and burst, and all the new wine, the good wine, would be poured out on the ground and lost. Everybody knows that you don't use an old skin with new wine. Why? Because the wine skin was too old to hold the new wine. The wine and the wineskin would be ruined. See, Jesus is doing something new that doesn't mix with the old. You can't combine old and new without destroying both. 
old religion was blocking this new way that Jesus was bringing. Man-made rules were getting in the way of what Jesus was trying to do. Jesus was saying, your outward displays of religion, they, they don't indicate an inward change of your heart. You have to experience God on an everyday personal level if you're truly following him. Attending church, praying for your meals, giving a few bucks, these things adding into your life and other things, they're not, they're not enough to change your heart. Just doing religious things doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. Following Jesus is all about living in a daily relationship with him. Following Jesus is all about doing what he asks you to do. It's all about surrendering life, your life to his plan. Following Jesus is knowing him personally and doing what he says. Following Jesus is all about embracing the new things that Jesus wants to do in your life. You can't just stick Jesus onto your life or pour him into your life and then think that you are a follower. Following Jesus is all about becoming a new person. A new person. It's interesting the Apostle Paul talks about this. We're not going to go into it a lot, but in, in 2 Corinthians 5, I mean, Paul gives us this, this verse 17 that is a well-known passage, and it really speaks into this. Look what Paul says. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Wow. Following Jesus is all about becoming a new person person, a new person. That's what it's all about. So we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we trying to add Jesus into our lives just like to sew on a patch? Are we trying to pour the new of Jesus into our old ways of living? I mean, am I trying to pour the new of Jesus into the old of my life? My old habits, my old thinking, my old way of living? And Jesus is saying, you know, it's not going to work. It doesn't work that way. You don't, you don't just mix old with new. Jesus is saying you can't just merge the old with the new. It, it, it doesn't work. I mean, look at what he says very clearly at the end of verse 38 there. He says, new wine must be stored in new wineskins. I mean, look at that again. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. What's he emphasizing? New. It's real simple. I mean, what Jesus does inside us continues to grow and expand just like the wine that is fermenting. And we must be expandable and pliable and yielding and surrendering every part of our lives being affected by this process as Jesus expands who we are through the Holy Spirit. And as we continue to expand, our capacity for more of Jesus grows. The more we receive, the more we're able to receive, and the more we receive, the more we want to receive, the more of Jesus we want to be poured into our life. Friends, Jesus is doing something new. I mean, here we are in the midst of COVID, and, and you know, people are all, all the time all around us talking about this new normal. What's the new normal going to look like? I think Jesus is wanting to do something new in our lives spiritually. He's wanting to do something new in your heart, in my heart. He's wanting to do something new. But our old life, our old way of doing life, can't handle it. Your old life can't handle the new that Jesus wants to do in you. Man, that rhymes. That's good, isn't it? Your old life can't handle the new that Jesus wants to do in you, in me. Jesus wants to do something new, but your old life can't handle it. You can't keep living your old life, your old ways, you have to change. You can't stay the same. That's what Jesus is saying. And then he wraps up the story really with another parable. In fact, there's really three parables that we've looked at, and it, they all start with the phrase, no one. It's interesting. Jesus throws a problem here at the end. He's saying you, you have to change. You, you have to bring in the new and get rid of the old and all of that. And then look at what Jesus says. He shows us this problem. He says, but no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. They say the old is just fine. I, I, I think, you know, we could kind of add on to that, that it's good enough. It's good enough. 
It's true that the wine gets better with age, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about, you know, he, uh, old wine, new wine isn't referring to aged wine and fresh wine. See, Jesus is talking about the kind of wine people have been drinking for years and then comparing it with a different kind of wine, not the same brand. A different kind of wine, a new kind of wine that they are not used to. And Jesus is saying that people don't want a new kind of wine because they think the old kind of wine they've had all along is good enough. I hate that phrase, good enough. If you've been around me at any length of time, you know I hate that phrase, good enough. Do you want to settle for good enough in your life? I don't. Do you want good enough, you know, in your life? Do you? Or do you want the best that Jesus offers? Jesus calls us to let go of the good enough, the good enough to experience his new. He calls us to let go of the good enough to experience his new. New life. New covenant. He talked about that at, you know, at the Last Supper when he was having a communion experience like we call it with his, the Passover with his disciples. The new covenant, the new love, new hope, new purpose. The Apostle John speaking about the end of human history, but, but he gives us something about Jesus, a characteristic about Jesus that I think ties in here. Look what he says about Jesus. The one sitting on the throne, he's pointing to Jesus, talking about Jesus. The one sitting on the throne said, Jesus said, look, I am making everything new. Huh. Everything new. Jesus is always doing something new. And that's tough for a lot of us, isn't it? I mean, aren't we kind of like what Jesus is talking about at the end there? We say, well, you know what we have, the old, it's good enough. I, 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 don't, I don't really want to change. I like the old. I, I, don't, I don't like the new. There's something that we think is better about the old. And what's interesting is the old has a tendency to be intoxicating, I mean, it's familiar, it's easy, it's comfortable, I know it, I can control it. The old way of doing things, the old way of living our life, the old way gets a grip on our hearts and we don't want to change. Don't underestimate the pull of the old in your life because you can't stay old if you're going to follow Jesus. You can't stay the same if you follow Jesus. You have to get rid of the old to follow Jesus. The Apostle Paul, out of the new century, says it this way. If anyone belongs to Christ, the old things have gone. Everything is made new. This, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, Koine Greek, a little bit of Aramaic. And then it was later translated into English so that we could have it. And I'm so glad it was that translated for us. And this word new, everything is made new. This is an interesting word. It's kainos. And, and it means fresh, unused, unworn, of a new kind, unprecedented, uncommon, unheard of, not like this before. Is that the kind of life you want? If so, your old life can't handle the new that Jesus wants to do in you. And so, Jesus invites you to let go of your old, to experience his new. You know, this could be the first time that you've ever thought about this considered this. Maybe it's the first time that you've ever felt that maybe God is speaking to you. Jesus is speaking to you. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know, I, I want this. Today, maybe you want to step into a relationship with God through Jesus for the first time. And, and, and I would encourage you to surrender your old life so that you can have the new life that Jesus offers you. But maybe you're already a follower of Jesus. And today you're realizing, you know, I, I can't mix my old life with the new that Jesus is bringing. Today you're realizing that you've been trying to add Jesus into your old life and it's just not working. And today maybe you're saying, you know, I, 
I want this new that Jesus is bringing. I, I'm ready to throw away my old way of doing life, and I want to embrace the new that Jesus wants to bring into my life. Either way, first time, we're coming into a renewed commitment, a new commitment. Jesus is speaking to you, he's speaking to me about getting rid of the old and embracing his new. Jesus invites you, invites me to let go of our old and experience his new. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you for your words. And the teaching that you gave so many years ago, it is so relevant for us today. Here we are in the midst of facing uh, this pandemic, this, this COVID, and it has forced us to experience things that we have never experienced before. And, and our world, our lives, our families, our emotions, our thoughts have been turned upside down so many different times. It seems like every time we turn on the news, there's a new update that um, just changes everything for us. And even this week, that's what we have faced. In the midst of all of this, you come in with a message of wanting to bring new into our lives. Maybe for some of us, it's the first time that we've ever considered being in a relationship with God through you and this new life that you're wanting to bring into our lives. Maybe this is the first step that we're gonna take. I realize, Jesus, that you call us to believe in you to believe that you are the son of God and that you died on a cross and then to ask you to be the leader of our life. When we do that, when we confess with our mouth, hmm, you step into our life in a way that's brand new and you begin to change us from the inside out. I ask that, that God, you would speak, Jesus, you would speak into the lives of so many of my friends listening, watching today. For some of us, We've been doing this um, following you for a while now. And we are seeing that part of our issue is that we're trying to mix our old life with the life that you want to bring, the new life. And for some of us, we've been carrying this old life, these old habits, these old thoughts, these old, this old way of doing things, this old way of living life. We've been carrying this a long time. And you're speaking directly at us and you're and you're saying to us, let it go. Let go of the old and embrace my new. Help us to do this. We hear your challenge in this. Help us to lean into you. I want, and I think a lot of my friends want, the best that you have. I want more of you. So help me let go of my old so that I can experience your new in my life. Thank you for being a God that loves me this much and that would offer this to me. We pray this, everybody together, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for being with us today. I hope that you tune in next week for part two. It's going to be real exciting. God bless you. Stay safe.